everyone. Welcome to the Math 243 workshop. My name is Ramya. I am the IT coach. This workshop is on module 8. In this workshop, we will be covering ANOVA and the G-square test. So we're going to understand the one-way ANOVA and perform G-square test. So factors and levels. So what are factors and levels? Factors are also the predictor variables. And levels are, is the response variable. Suppose an experiment is conducted on the effects of age and gender on reading speed using three age groups, 8 years, 10 years, and 12 years. So the factors here would be the age and the gender. And the levels would be 8 years, 10 years, 12 years, and under gender, it would be boy or girl. So what is the ANOVA? The analysis of variance is a hypothesis testing technique used to test the equality of two or more populations, means by examining the variances of samples that are taken. The ANOVA is based on comparing the variance between the data samples to variation within each particular sample. And the assumptions are that all populations involved follow a normal distribution, all populations have the same variance, and the samples are randomly selected and independent of one another. So if you recollect, in modules 3 and 4, we did the hypothesis testing, where we did hypothesis testing for one sample and for two samples. ANOVA is a way of doing hypothesis testing when, it, when we are dealing with more than two samples. So here we're going to be comparing all the means of all the samples and we're going to perform the hypothesis test. So here are the steps involved. Given K groups taken from independent populations, the null hypothesis would be that all the means are equal for all the populations. So if there are K populations, we're saying mu1 equals mu2 up to mu k. So there is no difference in the means. The alternate hypothesis will be mu i not equals mu j for some i not equal to j, where we are saying that there is at least one pair of populations which are not the same. So we don't know which one it is, but you're saying that at least there exists one which is not equal to another. The statistic used here is the F statistic, which is the between group variance over within group variance. Then we'll be finding the P value, and then compare the P to alpha, and then make a decision. So if P value is less than alpha, we will reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, we will not reject the null. So here is the Python code. So we import pandas and import skypy.stats as st. Then we have a variable called scores, which will have all the data from the CSV file. Then we have having four other variables which will have the exam scores, four different exam scores, exam one through exam four. And then print st.f underscore one way, takes on all the four variables, and it returns two values, the f statistic and the p value. So the f statistic is 3.8 and the p value is 0 0.0103. Another way of doing the ANOVA test is to obtain the ANOVA table. So here again, when you we have looked at this code before, um, it uses the OLS function. So in the output, the table that we get, we have the F statistic, which is 3.8, and then the P value. So let's do an example. A teacher believes that the exams 
created for the class varies in difficulty because of the differences in mean exam scores. Does sufficient evidence exist as, at the alpha equals 0.01 level to support the teacher's belief that the exam scores have different means? You see an over table below. So we have the output. So the null hypothesis is that the mean exam scores are all the same. And the alternate hypothesis is that the means of at least two exam scores are different. So from the output, here we have the F statistic, which is 3.8, and the P value, which is 0 0.0103. So we're going to make use of that. We compare the P to the alpha. So P is greater than alpha. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. And our conclusion is that insufficient statistical evidence exists to support the claim that the mean exam scores are different. So as we saw in the ANOVA, when we are when you're doing the hypothesis test, our alternate hypothesis is that there are at least two populations which are not the same, whose means are not the same. But we will not know which are the two populations. So if we have four different populations that we are comparing, like in the example, you we are comparing four different exam scores, if our conclusion was to reject the null, then we are saying that there exists at least two exam scores whose means are not the same. But we will not know which one of them are not the same. Is it exam 1 or exam 2 which are not the same, or exam 2 and exam 4 which are not the same? You will not know which pair it is. That's when we need to do the post hoc test. The post hoc test will help us find out which pair is it that don't have the same means. The ANOVA is used in hypothesis testing to check if the means of different populations are the same. If the null hypothesis is rejected, that would mean that the means are different. Sometimes you really need to know which groups are significantly different from other groups. The ANOVA test results don't map out which groups are different from the other groups. The post hoc test helps us determine which of the groups have different means. Post hoc, in Latin, it means after this. It means to analyze the results of your experimental data. And one of the most common post hoc tests is the Tukey's test. So the purpose of the Tukey's test is to figure out which groups in your sample differ. It uses the honest significant difference, a number that represents the distance between groups, to compare every mean with every other mean. The procedure gives the 95% confidence intervals for the mean difference between pairwise groups and determines which mean difference is statistically significant. These confidence intervals provide ranges of values that likely contain the actual population difference between the pairs of groups. When a confidence interval does not contain zero, the difference between that pair of groups is statistically significant. So what we're going to do is we are going to find the difference between the means for different pairs of population. And for each of the difference in the means, using the difference, we are going to construct the confidence interval. The confidence interval will be a 95% confidence interval for the mean difference between the pairs, which means we will be 95% certain that the actual difference in the means lies in this range. If this range does not contain zero, then we say, that the pairs of groups are statistically significant, which means their means are not the same.
because the interval we are constructing is a 95% confidence interval and we have 95% certain that the mean difference lies in this interval. If this interval doesn't contain zero, it means that both the means are not the same. Because if they were, then when you find the difference in the means, it would be zero. And zero should have been in the confidence interval. So we have the Python code here. So it makes use of the multi comparison function. And then we do two key HSD function. So this is for the same example. So here we have four different exam scores. So we're trying to compare which of the exam scores have different means. So we are grouping them. So first pair is exam one and exam two. Then we do exam two and exam three. Then we compare exam three and one and four. And for each of these pairs, you find the mean difference, which is the difference in their means. And using this value, we construct the confidence interval. So the next two columns give us the lower and the upper values for the confidence intervals. And then we look at this confidence interval and see the values that are included in this interval. So the first one goes from negative 10.7 through 4.16. So this range includes the value 0. So it is possible that the difference in the means for these two exams could be 0, and it could be in this range. So because 0 is included, it's not statistically significant. So the last column says false. But if you look at the next pair, exam 1 and exam 3, the mean difference in the means is negative 9.36. And using this value, we construct the confidence interval. And the value ranges from negative 16 through a negative 1.8. This range does not include 0. So the difference in the means for these two groups is not zero at any time. So that suggests that the differences, the means are not the same. And that's why the last column will say a true. So it will be this pair which will be statistically significant. And the rest of the pairs, you can see, they would all include the zero. So it is only this pair, exam 1 and exam 3, whose means are not the same. So this kind of a test, the, Su the Suki's test, helps us find out which pair are statistically significant. So let's do the chi square test. There are a few types of chi squared tests that we're going to be doing. The first one is chi squared goodness of fit test. The chi squared distribution can be used to test how close the observed distribution of population is to a theoretical distribution. The chi squared test statistic measures how different the observed counts are compared to the expected counts. So when we run a survey or when we're doing an experiment, we have certain set of values which are the observed values. And then we can come up with another set of values, which are the expected values, the theoretical values. This chi squared test, test helps us compare the observed and the expected and tells, helps us measure how different they are from each other. Are they the same or are they different? And we do an, an hypothesis test for that. So we set the null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the random variable follows the expected distribution. So it's, it just means that there's no difference between the observed and the expected values. The alternate hypothesis is that the random variable does not follow the expected distribution. The test statistic, the chi squared value, is given as the observed value, which is OI, minus the expected value, EI, over, now that result is squared, and that is divided by the expected value, EI. And we have to do this for every set of values in our table. So 
So then we find the p value. The degrees of freedom is equal to k minus 1, where k is the number of categories. Then we make a decision. So we compare the p to the alpha and then make a decision. The p value is less than alpha, then we reject the null. And we conclude that the distribution does not follow the expected distribution. If the p value is greater than alpha, then we say that insufficient evidence exists to reject the null. And we conclude that the distribution does not fo follow. The distribution, I'm sorry, I think there was a mistake here. So when you are not rejecting the null, then you're saying that distribution follows the expected distribution. That's how it should have been here. So let's do an example. A biologist keeps track of the composition of a population of birds on a lake. Last week, 50% of the birds were ducks, 23% were geese, 12% were cranes, 10% were swans, and 5% were coots. This week, bi the biologist counted 61 ducks, 17 geese, 11 cranes, 15 swans, and 6 coots. Is the composition of the population the same as last week at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance? So the null hypothesis is that no difference exists between the populations from last week and this week. So the expected number of each type of bird is the percent from last week times the total number of birds this week, which is 110. So in this table here, we have the observed values, which are the values that have been seen this week, 61, 17, 11, 15, and 6. So last week's, we don't have the exact count, but we can find it. How? This week's count we have. And we know when we add up all of them, when we add up all the values in the observed column, it comes to 110. So we have a total of 110 birds that we are studying. So the, we can easily find out what the values were expected to be last week. So last week, they say 50% of the birds were ducks. So we want to do 50% of 110. And that would be 55. Then you want to do 23% of 110. So that would be 25.3. So we can come up with the expected values for last week based on the total count that we have this week. So we have the expected and the observed values now. The next step would be to calculate the test statistic. So test statistic is observed value minus the expected value over the expected value. So if we go back to the table, so the, for, for the first set, for the ducks, the observed value is 61. You want to subtract 55 from it. So you want to do 61 minus 55, and then square that and divide it by the expected value, which is 55. So that's the first term, 61 minus 55 squared over 55. Then you want to do plus, and then you want to take the next set. You want to do observed minus the expected over the expected. So you want to do this for every set. And when we do it, we get 5.244. So distribution has k minus 1, which is equal to 4 degrees of freedom. So here, the number of categories here is, is 5. So you want to do 5 minus 1, and that's why we have 4 degrees of freedom. So using technology to calculate the p-value for the g squared equals 5.244 gives p equals 0 0.263. So we'll be looking at the Python code. Um, in a few moments from now, and you see how you can calculate the p-value from the g-squared value. So when you do that, you get p equals 0.263. Now, since this is greater than alpha, insufficient evidence exists to reject the null hypothesis, and the counts of birds this week are consistent with the expected distribution. Next is the G-squared test for independence. This test is used to determine whether two or more variables are independent by comparing the distributions of the variables over two or more categories. 
And let's look at the contingency tables. We need the contingency table to create the expected values. So below is the data on parole violations and punishment records involving 2,963 inmates at the Illinois State Reformatory. Punishment records include no prison time, one to two years, years in prison, or at least three years in prison. Violations are annotated as parole violation and no violation. The researchers examined the association between a punishment record while in prison with success or failure while on parole. So here in the table below, we have two sets of variables. One is the punishment and the other one is the violation. What we will be trying to do is we are trying to find out is there a relationship between the, the punishment years, the number of years spent in prison, to the violation when the inmate is on parole. So what we're trying to say, see here is if the punishment is none, then does that have an effect on the parole violation and no parole violation? When the punishment is one to two years, does that, does that have an effect on the violation? In order to do this, we need to find out the expected values. And the contingency table helps us create the expected values. So let's see how we can come up with the expected values in the table. So this is the observed. The first table is the observed one. And we have to come up with the expected values. So the third column, if you see, is the total by punishment. So it adds up every row. And then the last column in that row will give you the total. So 405 plus 1,422 is 1,827. So every row is added up. Similarly, we add up every column. So for the first column, the total is 796. For the next column, is 2,167. The last value in the last column is the total. So when we do the expected value, the way we come up with the expected value is we take the total for every row, and then we take the corresponding total for the first column. You multiply them, and then divide it by the total value. And that's why you have the first set of values here, 1827 times 796 over 2963. The value that we get will be the first value in our table. And we have to do this for every set. So if we take the same, so let's take the next row. If we take the next row, we have 240, 470. When you add it up, we get 710. So we take the total, 710, multiply it with the column's total, first column's total, which is 796. You multiply the total and then divide it by the total value, 2963. So that gives me 191, and that would be the second value in my first column. And we want to do this for every value in every row. And that would give us the expected table. So if you take the first value in the second column, We have to do the same thing. So we take 1422, sorry, you take 1827 and then take the total of the second column, which is 2167. So 1827 times 2167 divided by 2963 should give you the expected value for this second column. And that would be 1336. So we create the expected values, and then we do the hypothesis test. So for the hypothesis test, the steps involved will be pretty much similar to what we did before. You will have the, the null and the alternate hypothesis. Then you have the expected values from the table. Then we can find the t-squared value, then the p, and then compare. 
So before we look at that, let's look at the Python code for the test for independence. So here we have a variable called parole. So we do parole equals np dot array. And let's look at the values that it is taking. So 405 and 1422 is the first set of values. So it's taking all the observed values. 405, 1422. Every pair of observed values is taken and it's put into an array. And that's called parole. And then we do g2, comma p, comma df, comma ex equals g2 underscore contingency it takes on the parole variable. So what this function g2 underscore contingency does is it returns four values. The first value is the g2 value. Second is the p value. Then it will give us the df, degrees of freedom. And then it gives also gives us the expected values. So when you run this code, you get the expected values. So you don't have to actually do it by hand every time. You can run this Python code and get the expected values. So here are the steps for the test of for independence. So the null hypothesis is that the two variables are independent. And the alternate hypothesis will be that they are not independent. So equivalently, the null hypothesis is that no association exists between the two variables, in which case the alternate hypothesis is that association exists between the two variables. So then we have to calculate the test statistic which is the observed minus the expected squared over the expected count. Then use statistical software to find the p-value. If the null hypothesis is true, the chi-squared test statistic has a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to r minus 1 times c minus 1, where r is the number of categories of the first variable, which is the rows in the table, and C is the number of categories of the second variable, which is the columns in the table. Then we make a decision. So compare the P with alpha. If P is less than alpha, we reject the null. And we say that uh, the two variables are not independent. If P value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject the null. And we say that the two values um, are not independent are dependent, I'm sorry. Next is the chi-squared test of homogeneity. Mathematically, this test yields the same result as the chi-squared test for independence. The null hypothesis for this test is that the distribution of one variable is the same across all categories of the other variable. So this test is very similar to the test for independence. But here, what we are trying to test is if one variable has the same distribution throughout all the categories of the other variable, which means you'll be taking every row and checking if the values across the row in the columns are the same. So the null hypothesis here is P11 equals P12 equals P1 J. So what you're saying is taking one variable and we're checking if the value is the same across all the categories of the other variable. And you want to do this for every row. So I here, 1 through I represents the categories of the first variable and J equals 1 through J represents the categories of the second variable. Fundamentally, the null hypothesis says that the distribution of one variable is the same across all sampled populations. The alternate hypothesis is at least one of the probability statements is false. Then we calculate the test statistic. And then here again, we have to do the p-value. The degrees of freedom would be r minus 1 times c minus 1. Then we compare it with alpha and then make our decision. So if p is less than alpha, then we reject the null in favor of the alternate. We conclude that the distribution of one variable is not the same across categories of the other variable. And if p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, 
then we say that insufficient evidence exists to reject the null. And we conclude that the distribution of one variable is the same across categories of the other variable. So let's compare the chi-square test of homogeneity versus the test for independence. So a chi-square test of homogeneity is appropriate when a sample is taken from two or more populations. In that situation, the null hypothesis says that the distribution of one variable is the same across all sampled populations. So that this test, the test for homogeneity, we usually use when we have different populations, not the same population. But in contrast, the test for independence is used when two or more variables are compared within a single sample. Sometimes they are used inter interchangeably, but this is the basic difference that one of them, we, it deals with two or more populations and the other one, we're talking about different categories within the same population. Let's look at an example. The table below gives the frequency in which a sample of men and women drink tea. So do men drink tea with the same frequency at alpha equals 0 0.05 significance level? So here is the table. So the null hypothesis is that the distribution of the frequency of tea drinking is the same for men and women. So that's what we are going to be testing here. So for every row, we are going to be testing if the values are the same across the columns. So less than five per year, we want what you're actually trying to test is do men drink the same quantity as women? So 551 is for men and 580 is for women, but what we are trying to test is is it the same? So five to ten per year. So we want to check if it's the same across the columns 244 and 289. So here is our table, the contingency tables. We have the observed values, then we have the expected values. Expected values we have come up in the same way as I was just showing you a few minutes ago. You want to do the total for every row. So you want to do 551 uh, plus 580. You want to set up the third column here and have the total for every row. Similarly, down here, you want to have the totals for the columns. And then for every value, you want to take the total for that row, then the total for that column, multiply it, divided by the overall total that you will be getting, in the last value of the last column, and you will come up with the first expected value in the first column. And you want to do the same for all the values in every row and every column. So if you do that, you can get the expected values. Once you have the expected values, you want to find the test statistic. So you want to do the observed minus the expected count over the expected count. So here we can use Python for that. So we have Z equals np dot array you want to give all the observed values in an array and then g2 comma p equals g2 underscore contingency which takes on z it will return the g squared statistic and the p value so here g squared statistic is 32.24 and the p value is 1.70 times 10 raised to a negative 6, which is a very, very small value. So since the p-value is much smaller than alpha, the null hypothesis is rejected. And men and women, we conclude that they do not drink tea with the same frequency distribution. So that brings me to the end of this workshop. I hope you found it useful. Thank you for watching.